Good morning and welcome to the Japan Society's regular webinar on current affairs and business and much else. I am Bill Emmett and as many of you know I have the honor and pleasure of chairing the Japan Society. Thank you all for your support of the Japan Society and all of its online events. This week our discussion is going to enter the world of cute kittens and digital pets, of karaoke and pocket monsters, of video games and blockbuster animated films, of manga and cosplay, of otaku, and the Proud Boys and QAnon in America. In other words, about the entertainment business, but also about what is now a central element of Japan's worldwide image and reputation, and something in many aspects of which it has been something of an unheralded pioneer. I'm sure all of those on the call from the UK, however, can remember the fabulous exhibition at the British Museum on manga in 2019, the largest exhibition of manga ever held outside Japan. It gave us an insight into the origins and development of manga art, but it was also a real window into Japanese society. Today, our eye can be caught by an anime film based on a popular manga series, which has smashed Japanese box office records, overtaking Miyazaki's Oscar-winning Spirited Away. Kimetsu no Yaiba, or Demon Slayer, has also become an international hit, especially in other Asian markets. Its author, Gotouge Koyahara, has just been named by Time Magazine as one of the world's 100 emerging leaders who are shaping the future. So where is this leading? Where is this phenomenon going? What is it doing to the business of famous companies such as Sony and Nintendo? And what does it tell us about Japan and its worldwide influence? To address those and other questions, I'm delighted to welcome today Matt Alt, an American who has lived in, in Japan for um, more than 17 years as a writer and translator, but also as a localizer of Japanese pop culture products for other markets. Matt has co-written a number of illustrated books on pop culture with his wife, Hiroko Yoda, about monsters, ninja, ghosts, and kawaii characters. And last year, he published this solo effort, which I highly recommend, Pure Invention, How Japan's Pop Culture Conquered the World. The book traces the social, artistic, and business history of this phenomenon from toy makers in occupied Japan right up to Demon Slayer and to the Nichan social networks. Today's event will be a conversation rather than a presentation, very much including your questions. Please, as usual, submit them at any time using the Q&A function and feel free to vote for other people's questions so as to bring them faster to my attention. Matt Alt, welcome to the Japan Society. Thank you for having me as a longtime reader. It's an honor, an absolute honor. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Good to meet you. So let's start with a rather general, but actually quite difficult question about Japanese pop culture. What's really Japanese about Japanese pop ah. culture? How do we distinguish the Japanese element of this phenomenon? Well, I think that's pretty simple, actually. It's uh, content made by Japanese people for Japanese people, and that is consumed outside of Japan uh, incidentally. Uh, it's not made for us. It's not made for the outside world. And that is, I think, the way that I would uh, define Japanese pop culture. So, I mean, if you go back in, in the history of your book, I mean, some of the things that uh, that had elements of this, the, uh, uh, the karaoke machine, uh, the Sony Walkman that uh, that uh, was sort of part of, of, of like a personalizing kind of uh, cultural experience in this way, were they were they part of this phenomenon or were they a kind of um, a, 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 I feel like a, um, a sort of uh, simply a, a sort of technological forebear? No, absolutely. They're part of it. You know, Pure Invention, my book deals with what I call fantasy delivery devices. These are more than just products. They're products that transformed the way that we looked at Japan and the way that we looked at our own lives. And from that standpoint, products such as the Walkman or the karaoke machine or even something frivolous like Hello Kitty uh, can be called to can be said to have truly transformed the dreams of the people who consume them, not only in Japan, but abroad as well and, you know, helped us redefine our lives in a more sort of modern way. And why do you think, I mean, that, that dream, that fantasy, as you say, the fantasy delivery, what is it about fantasy that sells? And why is particularly, is there a particularly Japanese 
element to that uh, that uh, liking for fantasy, or is that are they is the Japanese market a simply advanced version of all of our psyches? Well, the Japanese have been hailed as fantasy smiths since almost as long as uh, first, I shouldn't say first contact, but the opening of the ports back in the 1850s, which unleashed a flood of Japanese products onto the uh, European and American marketplaces, many of which were fantasies, ukiyo-e prints, sculptures, other forms of art. And in those pieces of art, in those fantasies, Westerners projected values that they believed they had lost in their march towards modernity and industrialization. And that sparked, as you know, a fad called Japanism that really uh, upended uh, much of the traditions of the West, particularly in the artistic sphere. I mean, the, the uh, Impressionists were hugely inspired by Japanese art. And in fact, that love for Japan and that love for Japanese fantasies is precisely where the name Pure Invention, the title of the book, comes from. A quote from an old uh, venerated poet by the name of uh, Oscar Wilde, who said, the whole of Japan is a pure invention. There is no such country and there are no such people, by which he meant the way that foreigners were consuming products from Japan, almost by definition excluded the real Japanese. They were immersed in the fantasy of Japan. And that still continues today to a, a very real degree, I, I believe. And do you think, uh, to go back into that history, which is fascinating, Similarly, I mean, the, as you say, the ukiyo-e phenomenon, you know, very much a, a, a Japanese uh, business made by Japanese artists for Japanese, the Japanese market. Was that also creating, a, a, as it were, a fantasy image of, of, of uh, their own country for Japanese consumers? Um, a fantasy image of the floating world, a fantasy image of, of, of uh, art and theater and so forth. Well, the Japanese, the, the artists and craftspeople who made those prints, you know, Edo was already a thriving consumer society by the time uh, Commodore Perry's ship sailed in with guns a-blazing and uh, opened the ports. I'm sure the Americans expected to find some backwards people there, but instead they found this nation full of people who probably had a higher literacy rate than that was in America at the time, full of all sorts of consumer products and books and things like that. And so this was a very savvy population. So when they saw that these old fashioned prints many of the styles of which were already long out of fashion in their home country, were being consumed abroad, they started producing more of them and appealing to the Westerners with their own outdated uh, traditions and, and fashions and things like that. So, you know, I think what a, a big part of what the foreign consumers of these products were interested in was the perceived authenticity of them, because it wasn't really made for the Americans or the Europeans or the French. It was made for the Japanese audience for the most part. There was a kind of reality to them uh, that didn't exist in products that were usually exported from other countries and intended for foreign audiences. And I still think you see that today in diehard fans of Japanese pop culture, otaku, uh, as it were. Uh, people like that are drawn to the authenticity of Japanese manga that they feel is very different from Western storytelling. They're drawn to the authenticity of Japanese video games that are made from a quite different pair paradigm from those of Western games. And the list goes on and on. So that quest for authenticity, I think, is really key to what makes these fantasies seem more than fantasies to the people who encounter them. It makes them seem like alternate realities and perhaps even alternate lifestyles. And just focusing on that, uh, that very interesting um, point about, about the, the uh, alternateness of, 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 uh, of, the, of those video games, as you say, very different from Western ones. Are they very different from Korean or Chinese or, uh, or other Asian ones? I mean, in other words, is this an East versus West cultural thing well, or is this a Japan versus others? I think, it, well, it, first of all, I don't believe that pop culture is a zero sum game. You know, when a Korean song hits big on the Western market, it doesn't mean that a Japanese song never will or that it knocked a Japanese song off the charts or vice versa. I mean, there's room for all sorts of, in our, in our hyper connected, hyper information society that we live in, there's room for all sorts of content all the time. It's like a fire hose. So and that's important, I think, to remember that it's not a zero sum game. But Japan has had a huge head start on other countries, not only in Asia, but in the West as well, in terms of urbanization, in terms of reaching certain milestones of modernity ahead, a little bit ahead of the West. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, in peaking during the bubble era 
and then crashing so spectacularly in the two lost decades that followed, it gave Japan a leg up on experiencing the entire post-manufacturing, late capitalist haze that we all find ourselves stumbling through today. And that's a big reason why Japanese products, ranging from Hello Kitty and the Walkman all the way up to anonymous internet image boards, resonate so much with us. Not because they were made for us, but they were made in a, for a society that was experiencing the turmoils that we're experiencing today a little ahead of the curve. No, that's, that's I think, a very interesting point and a very important point. Um, you uh, mentioned, of course, uh, Om Shinrikyo and, uh, and the terrible events in 1995, wasn't it? Yes, the, the Syrian, uh, sarin gas and uh, were yes. part of that kind of alienation culture. Um, yes. Leaping forward, I'm going to go back to Hello Kitty later. But, uh, I'm not going to leave Hello Kitty out of the way, but let's let's go sinister for a moment. Please, please. <laughs> um, uh, one thing that's interesting in that sense of pioneering and being ahead is uh, the relationship between these social networks, Nichan um, in in Japan, and uh, and what later became QAnon and the Proud Boys in America. And I was yes, I wrote in my uh, chairman's blog. Um, sort of shocked suddenly to see or startled to see the Proud Boys mentioned in a book about Japanese pop culture. So and, was I. Yeah. <laughs> Walk us through that a bit and the way in which as it were, this, uh, the, these two phenomena are connected uh, and also disconnected. You know, famously in the year 2001, the futurist William Gibson, who's a famed science fiction writer uh, who coined the uh, phrase cyberpunk, and he wrote uh, a series of key novels in that vein in the 1980s, visited Tokyo. And he was so struck by what he saw on the street, which was young people texting into internet connected cell phones, which at the time was something that did not exist in the West. This is before the, uh, the spread of, it was before the iPhone and it was before the spread of mobile internet abroad. And he wrote an article for The Guardian called Modern Boys and Mobile Girls. And in it, he said that Japan exists a few clicks ahead of us on the timeline. It's where the future begins. You know, he was referring to high-tech gadgets and things like that. But in fact, he was right in a more profound way because Japan was hitting milestones that I talked about before with the lost decades being ushered in. You had a period that you yourself wrote about in The Sun Also Sets in the late 80s when everybody thought that Japan would be buying up the world, that we would be living in a Japanized world. Uh, this was the peak of Japan bashing when, when, you, when you wrote that uh, seminal text. And as we all know, the, the crash of the Japanese stock market and real estate bubble ushered in some very dark years for Japanese people. Um, and this is what Gibson, I think, missed a little bit in his hyper-focus on gadgets and uh, high-tech fashions and toys and things like that, because Japan has, was facing many problems after the crash. It was a hyper-aged society. Demographically, it was suffering. It was suffering uh, political chaos. I think 14 prime ministers came and went during the, uh, the, the two decades between 1990 and 2010, uh, there was this general sense of a loss of what you might call the Japanese dream, a uh, hiring ice age, the Shu Shoku Hyogaki set in, young people couldn't get jobs, uh, safety nets evaporated. And amidst all of this kind of turmoil and chaos, you had the rise of newly disaffected people who didn't believe that they would have a chance to succeed in society in the way that their, that their forefathers had. The most Exotic, I guess you could say, and, and most dangerous example of this were the cults that rose up starting in the late 80s and most infamously with Alm Supreme Truth in the 1990s. Alm Supreme Truth was, is a very interesting case because it parallels what we're seeing with QAnon today in America in so many ways. It was a hybrid mixture of uh, Far Eastern religion in this case. Uh, it, Q is more Bible based and science fiction and manga and anime. Uh, those were all incorporated into its tenets. Uh, Alm also uh, recruited heavily using what were then uh, very advanced dial-up bulletin board systems. They had an office in Akihabara, the electronics district, and they were very aggressive about recruiting disaffected elites. And actually uh, in 1990, the head of Alm Shinrikyo ran for office in Tokyo. He tried to get into the national legislature and when he failed to get very much of the vote, he declared that it was a case of voter fraud and sent his uh, members to go march in the streets. 
when people laughed him off a couple of years later, he felt there was no other choice but to hasten the Armageddon that he believed was coming. And as we all know, launched that deadly and horrific terrorist attack on the Japanese subway system in 1995, which came uh, very close to the Kobe earthquake, which the Japanese government bungled its response so thoroughly to that the local Yakuza gang had to hand out blankets and relief supplies to people. So it's very easy to see that in the mid 1990s, the average Japanese person was wondering just what the hell had gone wrong with their country. They're experiencing an epic decline that nobody saw coming. And I think there's some really eerie parallels between that and what we're seeing, particularly in the United States right now. And how did it evolve um, in, in the Japanese context then? I mean, um, maybe to give us a little more hope about the way it might evolve in the US, but maybe I shouldn't be too literalist about that. But yes, you know, as you say, in that really in that period in the mid 90s, all sorts of reasons when all sorts of events there was a there was a, a terrific alienation in the sense of yes despair. um you had the development of these social tools these bulletin boards these networks you had um a kind of uh, alternative yes alternative right uh, sort of an alternative uh, system developing how is that how does that look now in japan 20 years on or nearly 20 years on 20, well know, i think it, it's the, the economists and the pundits basically wrote Japan off after the uh, bubble burst. You know, to them, Japan had become irrelevant because it was no longer a player on the global economic scene in the way that it had been projected to be. But strangely, that's when things actually got really interesting, because particularly as Japanese manufacturers began abandoning their own market, they began outsourcing abroad, young people began taking these newly cheap communication tools that had been honed in all throughout the 80s and by the 90s had become cheap enough to become consumer products that anybody could afford, like, for instance, pocket pagers. They were invented for salarymen and for doctors and for lawyers. But by the mid 90s, Japanese schoolgirls had to figure out how to hack these things and turn them into prototype texting devices due to a peculiarity of the Japanese language where you can write numbers and pronounce them phonetically. So by sending little numerical messages back and forth to one another on pagers instead of telephone numbers, they were able to do the rudiments of texting. And it was Japanese schoolgirls in the 90s who also emerged as trendsetters in all sorts of communication uh, technologies. They were ferociously early adopters of early portable phones. They were early adopters of emoji, uh, which we now take for granted, but were actually made as little graphical elements to allow websites to load faster during the very slow internet speeds of the era. It is schoolgirls who transformed those into a new argot, a new uh, lingo for the, for the online era. And it was schoolgirls who first adopted the, 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 most, uh, the world's first truly popular mobile internet phone system, the iMode system, which debuted in 1999. So you have all of these technologies that were invented for, for other reasons being repurposed by the consumers and particularly the young people of Japan who feel adrift. They feel like they've been abandoned by adult society. And what do they do? They fashion new tools out of the kind of detritus, detritus that the adults have left behind. And I think that is a big reason why Japan was so ahead of the curve at that point. And that's something we're seeing now abroad as so many Americans are feeling disaffected, as they're feeling like the American dream is falling apart. They're turning to new communication technologies such as 4chan, 8chan, 8kun, all of these different websites. We're seeing insurrections like on the Reddit forums when a bunch of disaffected young investors come together and topple hedge funds simply by using online investing tools in ways that the people who made those investing tools never imagined they would be used. They never imagined 8 million people would place a buy order at the same time on them. Uh, so you see this constant reinvention of consumer products by consumers, not by the people who are making them. And that was actually one of the key insights that I got from writing Pure Invention. Most of the time, the visionary inventors of the products that I talk about in the book had no idea how the products would actually be used in real life. They had their own ideas about it, of course, but they, they lost control of them once they went into the marketplace, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. So just putting my, just focusing just on the politics of it. I mean, you had the cults in the early 90s, late eighties and early nineties, you had the terrible terrorist attack and so forth. Is there anything like that today? Um, still going on that uh, you think we should know about, as it were, in, in these 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 networks in Japan, or has Japan kind of moved on beyond beyond that because of that, as you say, that 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 personal right. adoption and reinvention of everything. 
Well, Alm is certainly not a problem anymore. Right. Uh, you know, the, all of the ringleaders that were arrested and actually sentenced to death, and although it lives on in a much reduced way, it's it's very much that's not the issue in Japan right now. What is interesting are uh, a raft of other social issues that emerged during the those lost decades. For instance, all of these new social ills began to be described in the mass media. Parasite singles, who are young adults who are outwardly successful, but can't, for whatever reason, leave the parental nest and just stay at home with their parents. Hikikomori, uh, a word that we're all familiar with now, are kind of recluses who just don't even leave their bedrooms. Otaku is another word that rose to prominence in the early, uh, in the early 1990s, the late 80s and the early 1990s, to refer to people who were so adults, who were so obsessed with their childish hobbies, to, not only to the detriment of their social lives, but also to the detriment of their sex lives. Um, they were so obsessed with cartoon girls that they weren't dating or going out, which led to yet another phenomenon called herbivorous men, which are men uninterested in drinking or owning cars, dating, or any of the normal hallmarks of uh, adult masculinity. The interesting thing is we're seeing a lot of these same trends, which were hugely mocked in the mass media when they first appeared in Japan uh, by the Western mass media, now there are problems. Uh, recently, a Pew Research report revealed that more adults are living at home with their parents in America than any time in history since 1940. Um, we're seeing, uh, and I, just putting aside the fact that it's difficult to meet people in, in you know, when we're underneath, you know, corona restrictions and things, dating, marriage, childbearing, they're all in the decline in America. You can say that we're going herbivorous too. And so, you know, and, and, and probably in perhaps the most extreme example of this, during the siege on the Capitol in, uh, in January by QAnon supporters and Trump supporters, it emerged that large numbers of those young men had been facilitated or even driven there by their parents. You might remember Zip Tie Guy, the gentleman dressed head to toe in what looked like cosplay from a Call of Duty video game with a bunch of zip ties in his hand. He was masked. And the reason he was caught is because in that iconic photo of him vaulting over the staircase, his mother is standing behind him. Not only did his mother buy all the plane tickets, she took him to the insurrection. He's still living at home with her. So this is an extreme example we're seeing of her people who are, who are you could call this person a parasite single by the definition of it. They're seemingly a successful, you know, healthy adult person who's living at home with their parents instead of starting their own family and their own career because they feel like they can't. So it's those trends more than cults, I think, more than you know, dangerous groups, even like QAnon, that are the real issue or the real thing to watch uh, because they're affecting us, huge numbers of us, not just in America, all over the world, in developing countries, uh, excuse me, in advanced countries, advanced economies, all over the world. Yeah, no, that absolutely. That that is that's a fascinating point about the yes. about, about the being driven to the to the riot by your mother. <laughs> it's not. It's not funny. I shouldn't laugh, but it's, it's just, not funny at all. Though absolutely, you're right. It is kind of intriguing. Well, it's it's hard for me to imagine a situation, a similar situation in the 1968 student demonstrations in uh, Tokyo, for example. I don't think many of those students were driven to it by their parents. Uh, I don't think that was the case in the American anti-war demonstrations against Vietnam in the uh, 70s. I, this is a completely new phenomenon uh, and one that is driven by Japanized social issues that are happening all over uh, the advanced world. Now let's look at this, let's look at it as a business story for a moment, uh, being an old business journalist, let me, um, what is what determines in your th your view um, the the where the degree to which um, this the domestic business I mean almost the Galapagos market that you've described um, notoriously uh, a phrase used for kind of technological development but in this case say creating Japanese products for Japanese consumers what determines when the these products can become globally marketable and become businesses. Uh, real business successes for companies like Sony and, and Nintendo and others, uh, and how far can it go? What, where, where is that? How is that developing in your view? Well, the, the fascinating thing that I learned when I wrote the book, and I, I cover a good eight to 10, what I call fantasy delivery devices, which are products that not only hit, but were, you know, kind of, they, were, they were influential and they were really inescapable presences all around the world. One of the things that struck me is how few of them 
were even intended to be exported at first. Uh, a key case in point is the Nintendo Entertainment System, which was uh, it, it debuted in Japan in 1982. It was called the Family Computer. It was made purely for the Japanese domestic market. There was no thought given to exporting it, but there was a belief in the industry at the time that fads, a new product cycle was exactly three years. And that was it. Once three years were up, the fad was done. So the president of Nintendo, when it looked like three years were coming up, said, well, I guess this is going to be it. Let's just try and export this and see how it goes. There was no master plan. There was no dream of taking over the world. He just thought he might get another three years of the Americans and the Brits and the French, you know, to kind of extend the life of this console. He had no idea that the Nintendo Entertainment System would prove so incredibly popular around the world that by 1990, a survey revealed that more Americans recognized Mario than they did Mickey Mouse. So this emergence of Japanese fantasies as an alternative to Western ones came almost in spite of Japanese tastemakers. But that's precisely what gives these products the authenticity that people who love them crave and this kind of snake eating its tail uh, arrangement where it's feeding in, they feed into the image that they are unique and they feed into the image that they are authentic simply by not so nakedly appealing to us. It's worth mentioning, of course, that the Mario um, there is a Japanese product deliberately using an Italian first name. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, the, the, uh, the, the old, the, we, nobody knows if it's true or not, but supposedly he's named after uh, the Italian American landlord of Nintendo America who burst into the room demanding his rent when they were discussing what to call the character. Oh, so, so, <laughs> yes. So he was originally called Jumpman. He, that's, that was his name in Donkey Kong, the first video game in which he showed up and he didn't have a, much of a backstory. <laughs> now <laughs> Italy has a new prime minister, Mario Draghi, who's being known, being described as Super Mario. And one thing, oh, they're naming him after a Japanese character, but it's the Japanese character was named after an Italian. <laughs> yes. Well, are you sure they're not naming? Are you, are you sure that's not a reference to Prime Minister Abe, who uh, famously jumped out of a pipe dressed like Super Mario during the Rio Olympics? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> How could I forget? <laughs> <laughs> what a moment in, in post-war Japanese uh, culture and politics. Yeah. But what about an anime film and uh, Demon Slayer and so forth? Okay, well, anime, Where are they anime get, is, uh, is a 100% created for the Japanese market. And the fact that it's doing so well abroad is not due to any concerted effort on the part of anime producers. It's because over many years of consuming Japanese fantasies, mainly in the form of Japanese video games, uh, which themselves in many cases are based on Japanese cartoons or incorporate conventions of Japanese cartoons into them as kind of visual aids or metaphors, uh, what have you. We have been consuming those products for so long now. The Nintendo Entertainment System has been on the marketplace uh, in America since 1985, England, I believe, since 1986. We've been consuming Japanese cartoons on our TVs, Power Rangers shows, playing with Pokemon cards. We have learned the kind of visual code, the cultural code of these products. So now they can be exported without having to localize them in as much as one had to in, in, in two or three decades ago, when you had to change all the names of the Japanese characters because you were worried kids wouldn't be able to pronounce them, or you'd have to change entire aspects of shows to make sure that Western audiences be, would be on board. Now, if you try that kind of thing, even young audiences get up in arms. They get very upset because they feel that you are uh, adulterating the authenticity of these products that they want to consume straight from the source as an alternative to their own country's entertainment. So, you know, anime is definitely at the forefront of that. It hits a sweet spot. I think that illustrated entertainment uh, traditionally does not, especially in America, which had a, comics book, a comic book code authority that basically precluded artists from uh, portraying anything smacking of maturity or realism in their, in their graphic novels. We had all sorts of restrictions on what could be shown on television with regards to children's entertainment. None of those existed in Japan, and they allowed its uh, illustrated entertainment, both in the form of manga and in anime, to develop into much richer mediums of expression than we had in, in the West at that time. Um, I think it also helps that Japan had a very long history of, of, of making 
narrative illustrated art, those ukiyo-e prints that we talked about, the many scrolls, uh, that type of artistic expression was very much respected and, and there was a tradition that could be passed down, which is why after World War II, one of the very first industries to get kickstarted back into life was the manga industry. And, uh, and that actually led directly to the creation of the very first anime, Astro Boy, which debuted in 1963. So very quickly, Japan was getting back on its feet with the serving up of these fantasies to itself. And then people were enjoying them abroad as well. And they started noticing that and the race was on. Now there's a question, I'm gonna read up a question here from uh, Isabel Linehan about pop culture and the internationalization. She says, uh, what do you think about Japan's habit of making some aspects of its pop culture quite inaccessible, e.g. the unavailability of much Japanese music compared with South Korea's government backed policy of heavily promoting its pop culture abroad? Does this feed into the question of authenticity because it's really targeted at a Japanese audience? I suppose is to say, if you make if you make something seem unavailable, does it become more attractive? <laughs> the the Japanese music industry is a very unique sort of phenomenon. It was controlled and still is to a great degree by these things called jimusho. They're like talent agencies, and they ruled the industry with an iron fist. And they're mainly run by old men. And they, Johnny's Jimmy Show, which is the most famous of them, Johnny just passed away uh, last year. They were adamant about uh, not allowing even images of the artists to appear online in any way, shape, or form. They had absolutely no idea about viral marketing. They believed that the only way to make money was selling physical media. In other words, they were dinosaurs. They were total dinosaurs. And through that conservatism, they basically throttled Japan's ability to project its musical tastes abroad. And this is why, unlike anime, unlike manga, unlike toys, and so many other aspects of Japanese pop culture, Japanese music, the Japanese music industry is, is almost non-existent abroad. This is a big reason why K-pop has hugely leapfrogged uh, the Japanese music industry in the uh, hearts, minds, and ears of young listeners abroad. It's a huge missed opportunity um, and I, while I do believe that the fans of that music who seek it out and find it incorporate that difficulty of finding it into their fandom and even their identities, uh, it is absolutely nothing that was done on purpose uh, or was on purpose, but not for the reason of creating authenticity. So it's actually kind of a sad state of affairs because so many great Japanese artists never had their chance to really shine abroad because the restrictions placed upon them by Japanese, uh, uh, their Japanese handlers, so to speak, were just too arduous to overcome and not suited for our era of digital sharing. And that's not changing. It is changing. It is finally changing now. But this is one case, the music, uh, pop music is one place where Japan is hugely behind the curve when it comes to uh, other uh, Asian societies who have a much more, uh, I, I don't know if liberal is the word I would use, but certainly a much more technological understanding of how things work these days, how young people consume music. And that getting a billion hits on YouTube, even if you don't get a cent, can be worth its weight in gold and promotional purposes. Uh, these are all very cutting edge sorts of things for the Japanese music industry, but I think it is changing and I hope it does because there's a lot of talented people here whose voices uh, I think deserve to be heard. Dorothy Feenan has uh, asked a connected question. Hi, Matt, thank you so much for all your answers so far. I was wondering, do you think this fascination with quotes alternative lifestyles explains why Western Anglophone media still love to write about AKB48 even after their popularity has dramatically dropped off in Japan? <laughs> AKB48 is, yes, indeed, not exactly the force they used to be. And for those, for those who aren't familiar with them, they're a, a group of a teeny bopper idol singers, 48 of them. Uh, so you can kind of Pokemon style, you know, pick your favorites and collect them all as you're, as you're listening. Idol music in general, I think, is a very kind of unique uh, Japanese expression. And it, in fact, uh, emerged in the 1990s when Japan's uh, karaoke companies introduced the world's first streaming music service, which was serving up karaoke songs into uh, what were then called karaoke capsules or karaoke booths, karaoke rooms. The minute they digitized those songs and they put them into a format that you could pick them with a button, you were essentially voting with your choices. 
And before long, as karaoke emerged as this huge force in the Japanese marketplace, not only in the musically speaking, but also technologically speaking, all sorts of innovations and in hard drives and server technology were invented purely to make karaoke more accessible to the Japanese marketplace. As young people in particular flocked to these karaoke experiences, as they chose songs, the, the songs that they found easiest and most fun to sing, those choices were then fed back to the music producers who started choosing to produce songs that were easy to sing. In effect, virtuosity was put to the side in this kind of Kurt Vonnegut, Harrison Bergeron-esque averagitizing of the musical experience. In, in essence, if you couldn't sing it, if the average person couldn't sing it, it didn't get made. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not much. And that's what led to groups like AKB48, which are literally girls next door, who sing songs that literally the girl next door could sing because there aren't any divas in that group. There aren't any uh, uh, you know, incredible musical talents that are selling themselves on their voice. They're selling themselves on their character. And that's another hurdle, I think. You know, that was a kind of Galapagos style, uh, a, a kind of pocket universe of its own that really only existed in Japan and is kind of impenetrable for people who aren't in on the joke, so to speak, even though it's absolutely no joke to the people who are fans of it. And there's actually, of course, some fun tunes in there as well. But that uh, uh, big data ification of the Japanese music industry, which happened in Japan way before similar things started happening in the West. Now we have Moneyball for music. That is a factor from Spotify and all sorts of musical streaming services where you're ranking on the musical streaming service that it really shapes what kind of music gets made and has led to a certain sameness in a lot of the pop music coming out uh, in, in recent years. Uh, that started happening in Japan way earlier and who knows, maybe AKB48 is a, is a harbinger of our musical futures where nobody can sing any better or worse than anybody else. <laughs> oh dear <laughs> <laughs> hey even we can be stars you know yeah exactly that's, oh. that's the promise of karaoke god if only my mother could hear that possibility now um, <laughs> <laughs> music dystopia <laughs> uh, Lawrence Green has asked uh, really about alternative uh, or advanced modernity and navigating it um, I very much agree with your comments about Japan having experienced a form of advanced modernity before the rest of the world. With this in mind, what would you say are the key points and takeaways that other countries still have to learn from Japan in terms of consumer culture that might help them navigate this modernity? Leaving aside the AKB48 example. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, don't don't pattern yourself off their music industry. No, the uh, and I don't mean to I don't mean to insult the Japanese music industry or AKB48. If there are fans out there, please uh, take this in the spirit in which it's intended. I, I think it's interesting that Japan has recently been sort of spinning itself as what it calls in Japanese a kadai senshin koku, which is or kadai senshin kuni, which is a country that is at the forefront of dealing with problems that advanced societies face. And they are attempting to export their technologies dealing with, you know, robotics focusing on the elderly, um, with, you know, techniques and services that they've pioneered for uh, an audience that in Japan, a, a, a population in Japan that's not only a little bit probably older than those abroad, but has been through sort of some of the similar problems that everybody abroad has. The, the real issue is that we've now gone through this bottleneck known as COVID-19 and we're all kind of synchronized. We're on the same, we're all suffering the exact same problem everywhere in the world. We can't leave our houses and there's this fatal flu floating around outside. So the whether Japan is going to truly be able to continue to be a leader in this post-COVID world order is something I think that's really up, you know, it's a really, it's an open question. Uh, what isn't up for discussion, what is, what is absolutely obvious is that Japanese fantasies continue to have the same sway over us they once did, as evidenced by the fact that in March of 2020, a video game by the name of Animal Crossing made by Nintendo sold 11 million copies in 10 days. And this video game took the form of a virtual island that you could kind of furnish yourself and invite your friends to. It was an escape from all of the horrors going on on the news and the world around us. I think it's very telling that a game from Japan filled that need and that role in all of our lives. Um, and I think it's also interesting that another aspect of pop culture that I don't cover in huge depth in the book, but it's very important, is the love of, is the, is the West's view of Japan as a sort of solution for problems 
of modernity, most specifically uh, uh, Marie Kondo, who is you know, selling books, telling us how to strip down our lives and get rid of all of these possessions, many of which Japan undoubtedly sold us in the decades before uh, she became a, a famous cleaning guru. So it's uh, we've gone from consumerism to kind of anti-consumerism, but we're consuming that anti-consumerism uh, that's being spun at us with the authenticity of Japan's lived experience, a couple of those clicks down the timeline. That's something we're gonna see a lot more of, I think. Let me, um, I'm, uh, I want to move just briefly on to ghosts and spirits, because I don't want to leave that behind. Um, and Sergen Yonahan has asked, what's the role of spirits in Japanese mythos in the popular image of Japan today? Is the history of ghosts, the mode of superstition different from the Western one that is often said to be based on guilt? What are the specters of Japanese cultural memory? So that's a bit of a change of well, I, 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 I feel I, like we're I feel like we're talking about my uh, Hiroko, my wife Hiroko Yoda, and my uh, uh, series Yokai Attack and Yurei Attack, uh, uh, the books that we wrote about Japanese spirits and uh, and creatures of the night. I, I think one of the really key aspects of Japanese folklore that continues to color uh, its creative processes today is that Japan is a it comes from a very polytheistic and a very animistic sort of worldview. And when I say this, I don't mean that every Japanese person walking around or even a majority of them walking around would identify as polytheistic animists. I'm saying that this sort of ethos permeates Japanese uh, thought in the way that Judeo-Christian thought you know, pervades those in the West, even of those of us who aren't Christian or Jewish or of those traditions. That uh, the 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 those traditions of, of animism and polytheism manifested in the fact that anything in, in the world around us could have potentially have a spirit in it. You know, Shinto famously venerates uh, pieces of terrain. Uh, a kami can be almost anything, a god. Uh, Japan is said to be inhabited by 8 million gods, in fact, which aren't all gods with a capital G. There's, there are those kind of world creating beings on high, but so too is there a god of the toilet as a famous uh, pop song of a few years back had it and everything in between. So this kind of idea that almost anything can possess a spirit, I think, is a big driving force why Japan has become such a innovator in character culture. Uh, so many of its characters are anthropomorphic mascots. So many of its characters seem to be just everyday objects with eyes and a mouth on them, or in Hello Kitty case, no mouth. Uh, and while nobody would ever, ever, I hope, make the, uh, uh, the argument that Hello Kitty is Shintoist in nature, because I don't think she is, I think the reason that Japan is such a fount of creativity when it comes to making these whimsical sorts of characters, whether they're things like Hello Kitty or the creations of Studio Ghibli, is deeply rooted in those traditions of animism and deeply rooted in those traditions of polytheism that informed so much of Japanese culture up to the modern era and are still very much respected and loved today. Yeah, no, that is, that is interesting. I knew we'd get back to Hello Kitty, but I think- <laughs> Paging Lafcadio O'Hearn. I uh, wish I wish he were here to weigh in. He would probably have even more to say about it. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Agnieszka uh, Tsui has uh, said she runs a Japanese club for school-aged children. Um, and the thought of the, uh, the children of today share her interest and excited by the same things, including old anime, manga, Dragon Ball, Sailor Moon, as well as new ones, which do not differ much from the classics. So she's wondering, mm -hmm. does, is the coolness of Japan more universal and cross-generational cross in the past? Is there a case to be made that the greatest developments in Japanese pop culture are already in the past and the culture, current culture brings few new ideas or takes fewer risks? recycling old ones rather like Western franchises such as Marvel or Disney. How do you think? Well, it's, inter well, it's, it's interesting that, uh, that she brought up Dragon Ball, which um, actually is not that old for me. I, that came out when I was a teenager, I believe, uh, but uh, has continued in many forums until the present day. Dragon Ball is an example of what's known as shonen manga in Japan. It is comic books aimed at young boys. Um, they're read by both genders and all ages, but that's what they're called. And that's what they're known as. And it's published by a uh, manga magazine known as Shonen Jump. And Shonen Jump has a formula for these things. It really does. It has them down to a science. Uh, Dragon Ball, and particularly its later incarnation, Z and 
Super and Beyond are very much kind of cookie cutter plots with the same kind of repeating patterns going on. This is true about other shonen, popular shonen series like One Piece, for example, which is a, a similar one. And so too is it true about Demon Slayer, which is currently the most popular uh, shonen manga series in Japan. Uh, we talked about it, Bill talked about it a little bit at the beginning of this. Uh, it emerged seemingly out of nowhere, but actually from a very long tradition of making this sort of thing. And now, whether it's popularity in Japan and its popularity was huge. I can just tell you as somebody who's living here, you literally couldn't turn a corner without seeing an adver ad advertisement for something Demon Slayer oriented. And on uh, and a certain level, it was actually kind of shocking because although this is a hugely popular series among everybody from the elementary school set to, to young adults. It's actually quite gory and violent in parts. Uh, when my young niece told me that she was a huge fan of it, I was like, really? You like this? There's people getting splattered left and right here. Uh, but that, you know, so it goes because, you know, when something takes off among a critical mass of young people, uh, you know, you want to be watching what the other people are watching so you can you can talk about it. Japan still has a very strong ability to keep producing hits like this, whether they'll keep resonating abroad. That's an open question. But I think with recently, you've seen big companies like Sony investing in anime streaming services abroad, the rise of uh, in, in the role of companies like Crunchyroll, which is a pioneering anime streaming service, and also how much money and effort Netflix is putting into its anime offerings. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. I think much more likely than anime losing relevance, what we're going to see are a lot more co-productions with Western people. Increasing numbers of Western people are coming here to study Japanese anime style and increasing numbers of Japanese are collaborating with companies like Netflix who offer them deals that are much better than they can get in Japan. So you're seeing this kind of invigoration of uh, what was really quite a moribund industry, especially for the people with the lower echelons. Uh, with this infusion of foreign cash. So I, if anything, I think we're poised to see a, a sort of golden era of more and more anime coming out. But over the long term, it's really, it's anybody's guess. Does that, so a question, interesting question on precisely that issue here from Marie uh, Carnava, asking whether or not um, the influx of foreign cash, um, streaming services, Netflix originals, and so forth. Do you think that that uh, means that there's a risk that Japanese anime will become a product with foreigners in mind, losing some of its authenticity. You have hit on a critical discussion that's playing out across the internet, even as we speak. There's a lot, uh, you know, Netflix is very liberal about the things that it appends the anime name to. And I think it is obvious that when you get an influx of money from a foreign investor, you're going to try to appeal to them in some way or another. And even though quite a few of the Netflix anime series have been hits, they don't necessarily feel like anime in the traditional form that we've seen them. Then again, Japanese animators are nothing if not adaptable, and there's still plenty of content being made for domestic audiences. I actually think the biggest threat that the anime industry is facing is not uh, the, the kind of mixing in of foreign sensibilities, it is the fact that the people on the lowest rungs of the animation industry in Japan cannot make a living wage. They are working below the poverty line. Uh, there is no real ability to unionize. Uh, they are work to the bone. And I think that is a blight on a industry that the government is heralding as the, uh, as the beacon of Japan cool around the world. Um, I think if the government were really serious about the Japan Cool program, they would be doing more to assist these like desperately poverty stricken uh, animators uh, who are particularly the ones this, the ones just starting out. I mean, you literally cannot make a living wage uh, at most animation companies in Japan. And that absolutely needs to change or else anime is going to go extinct just like ukiyo-e prints did back in the late 1800s and new technologies came along. I mean, I, at this point, you'd actually, you'd have to be a pretty dedicated person to go into the anime industry instead of the video game industry, which does pay living wages uh, and which does offer somewhat uh, more livable working conditions. But that is actually the biggest problem I think facing anime, not uh, any kind of cross-pollination from Netflix. How fa that is actually really fascinating to think that uh, where this seemingly enormously successful industry basically doesn't pay living wages and therefore might might destroy yes. itself in, in yes. a way. Yes, it's absolutely in danger of that. 
So there's an interesting kind of question on a, on, a, on a side point of this, of what you're talking about, about the foreign uh, connection. Uh, Jiao Sa writes, um, thanks so much for an interesting talk. I was wondering if you share your opinion on the Afro-Japanese socio-cultural intertwinement and its presence in Japanese pop cultural production, Afro samurai, samurai, Champ I can't write really. Champlou. Champlou. Samurai Champlou. Champlou. That's it. I was wondering whether Samurai I was reading Champlou. correctly. Is, this I, a, um, is it a communal will to overcome racialized perceptions of self? Um, or do you believe it's just another way for the pop culture business to monetize itself? How do you, how do you see it? Well, actually, the, you know, the director of Afro Samurai actually blurbed our book, Ninja Attack, True Tales of Samurai Assassins and Outlaws, which was a, which was a huge honor for me. I really like that show. Um, it's interesting. I think because anime shy, traditionally shies away from Japanese, definitively Japanese portrayals of characters, they're all understood to be Japanese, but they don't really look Japanese. They come in a lot more varieties in anime, wild hairstyles, different skin colors, different outfits. So because of that, I think it's a lot easier for people, uh, for, for, for non-Japanese to kind of immerse themselves in the characters and the storylines of Japanese animation series. Uh, several animation series in particular seem to be particularly popular among the, uh, the black community, like Dragon Ball Z, who the, uh, uh, the, the leader of the Wu-Tang Clan, the rap group, wrote a book called The Tao of Wu. And in that book, he stated that he believed that Dragon Ball, uh, the story of Dragon Ball represented the journey of the black man in America. And, you know, that he was able to see that in that series, which was made for Japanese boys, uh, is a testament, I think, to the artistic achievement of, of the series, that, that he was able to see that and, and immerse himself in that. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's also a really interesting fact that these series are so capable of attracting audiences that they weren't explicitly made for. And uh, yeah, that's just, I mean, I think that's really key to anime's success. It doesn't really, a lot of it doesn't really feel Japanese. It's set in fantastic environments featuring people who don't look really like anyone. So they could be anyone. And that's a really tough, sweet spot to pull off, I think. And so and I, I know for a fact from the Japanese creators who I've spoken to that they hugely welcome all any and all audiences, whether they're uh, minorities or whether they're majorities. Uh, they're just happy that it appeals uh, to people's hearts. So there's another another question that uh, that uh, touches on some of that, as it were, the subject matter question you're talking about, Eric Hoisler. That's an inspiring conversation. Thank you so much. What role do you do the dark sides of Japanese capitalism, the social ills, gender discrimination, nuclear energy dangers, economic growth, not reaching everybody, hyper urbanization play for the invention and attractiveness of Japanese pop culture? I'm only familiar with symptoms and voices such as Akira Shigeru Mizuki's uh, history mangas. Oh, yes. Uh, depictions of Yakuza or Mieko Kawakami and other female novelists. Um, well, manga and anime, manga and anime artists have never shied away from portraying that dark side of the uh, the Japanese economy. You know, Akira, uh, the the smash hit uh, uh, sort of uh, dystopian sci-fi drama uh, that was in comic book form and later famously as an anime in 1989, portrays a Japan that's very much like 1968 Japan, politically paralyzed with venal uh, money grubbing politicians who are completely incapable of serving the needs of their, uh, of their constituents and an out of control military. The Japanese, the, the manga and anime industries have traditionally skewed very left. Uh, there was a great uh, exodus from the student protest movement in the late 1960s into the entertainment industries because that was one of the only industries that would accept people who hadn't graduated from college or might have had arrest records. And it tended to give a really strong scent of social protest to what were ostensibly shows intended for kids and teens. Um, the show Mobile Suit Gundam, which emerged in 1979, a kind of space opera modeled on the Star Wars uh, vein with giant robots engaging in combat in space, was this tale of these space colonists rebelling against the Earth Federation, and uh, where both sides were committing atrocities against one another, and where adults were throwing children into combat without any regard for their safety or their feelings or even their lives. So you have these kind of repeats 
of dark moments of Japanese history coming up again and again in Japanese popular culture as a form of criticism and critique. And so while there, you know, there are these dark, I, that's another thing that adds, I think, to the authenticity of, of Japanese uh, illustrated entertainment in particular, it's not something the authorities really would be happy to be seen as their face to the world. Um, you know, in this case, it's kind of similar to that movie Parasite, uh, the Korean movie that won the Oscar last year, a, a wonderful film. Uh, I'm shocked that the Korean government is so happy that it's, you know, their new face to the world because it paints a pretty damning picture of, of uh, you know, Korean uh, socioeconomic relations. So, too, for a lot of Japanese anime and manga out there, you brought up Mizuki Shigeru, who is a huge protester of the status quo uh, in Japan. And even as far back as the 1964 Olympics was drawing comics talking about the political graft surrounding these supposedly beloved games. Uh, and an Akira, of course, is set in the year 2020 when the 2020 Tokyo Olympics get canceled by plague and civil war. So maybe these are less comics and, and more kind of, uh, you know, presaging the actual future to come. And uh, I mean, uh, another related question has mentioned the highly sexualized imagery of, a lot of young girls in a lot of mainstream material which wouldn't be tolerated in many Western societies. Do you think no. that's a, similarly a permanent feature of Japanese pop culture or is that a kind of, does that, ev does that kind of thing evolve with social mores and social change? Well, we spoke earlier about the fact that there was nothing like a comics code in Japan and that allowed all sorts of expression to flourish. You know, in Japan, manga, it's, it's, really, it's, it's really, you know, key to say that manga and anime are not genres, they're media. So, you know, to pick out the more extreme forms of, you know, sexual or, you know, uh, you know, kind of dirty portrayals of youth and things like that, you can say the same thing about movies if you look at movies as a whole. You know, there's everything out there from Bambi to snuff films, you know, and there's, you can't really, I think, level a criticism against the entire genre for that. That being said, uh, in Japan as well, there's been recently, uh, over the last 10 years or so, some concerted efforts to try to keep the more extreme forms of expression out of the hands of minors in particular. But I don't think we'll ever see them go away because that is sort of the dark matter that keeps anime edgy and it keeps manga edgy. Not that that stuff will ever go mainstream, not that it should go mainstream, uh, you know, and it probably should be regulated, but that the fact that it exists just goes to show the wide array of things that you can say or do with this illustrated medium. Uh, it, it promotes a sense, I think, that anything goes in a way that you don't see, for example, in the American superhero comics or in American graphic novels. So yes, it's not a good thing when you know women or minors are portrayed in, in unsavory ways. And I hope that sort of thing never becomes mainstream. But the fact that it exists is more of a testament to the vagaries of the human imagination than it is any kind of inherent problem with the media itself, I believe. So there's, we're coming Sadly, to the close, there's more and more. Yes, questions. I could go all night. Yeah, fantastic. A lot of questions, <laughs> fascinating things. Um, but so I'm going to go the two final questions. One, one which takes the sort of broad look about uh, the image of Japan. Um, David Walter asking, does the rise of other East Asian countries, such as China, Taiwan, South Korea, their own histories of a relationship with modernity, or modernity and becoming successful cyber societies, does that undermine Japanese prestige or um, and, and alongside has America lost its own prestige? How is kind of Japan's, if you like, soft power or influence, influence related to this? How does it, how is it affected by what's happening elsewhere or is it entirely indigenous force? Well, I, 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 you know, similar to the conversation we were having about music earlier, I, I don't think it's a zero sum game, you know, that uh, when you're talking about esports, for instance, that, you know, Koreans are so strong in, in video game sports and Japanese people traditionally aren't, you know, that, that's, that's an interesting phenomenon. Does it change the fact that 11 million people flocked to buy, you know, Animal Crossing in March of last year? No. So, you know, these are sort of interrelated, but not, not explicitly directly related phenomena. And I don't believe that the rise of cyber connected societies or hyper modern societies in Taiwan or Hong Kong or, or, or you know, Seoul or in Beijing are, are a threat because I just don't believe they're threats in, in, in general. They're their own kind of bubble 
experiences. The fact that we turn to Japan so much, I think, is because we see in Japan a kind of safe doppelganger of ourselves. Uh, Japan is so like us in so many ways. Uh, you know, it's a small island nation like, you know, Great Britain. Um, it's a highly advanced, its cities are highly advanced, like, you know, like a New York or a London, you know, or a Paris. They're, they're, they're great cultural epicenters. There's very little crime here. And since the 1970s, at least, there haven't been any incidents of Japanese launching terrorist attacks abroad, you know, not since the Red Army of the 70s. There certainly hasn't been any Japanese military adventurism abroad. So because of that, I think Japan is a much kind of safer presence for people to contemplate than, for instance, China is, or Korea, who's locked in a perpetual civil war with North Korea is, or Taiwan, which is just kind of exotic in a distant place, I think, to most uh, uh, Americans. Uh, as great as, as Taiwan is, I love visiting Taipei. I, I miss that street food. But um, yes, so, you know, in Japan, again, just as people in the 18th century projected their values onto Japan, I think we're still doing that today in a very real way, in a way that we don't project our values onto, say, Taiwan or, uh, or other countries uh, in general. And I'm going to finish finally with a personal question that somebody has put, I mean, which is... Uh-oh. Well, it's not that personal, don't worry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's something Jake Elmore is asking um, do you, what your advice would be for those of us who are learning Japanese and plan on working in translation and localization. Um, is there something about getting onto that uh, onto that area now that you can share from having been on it for 17, 18 years? Well, I'm relieved. I'm relieved. I thought this was going to be a question about my relationship with Hello Kitty or something, but uh, I, I am absolutely, I do not know that cat. Uh, uh, study. I mean, seriously, I, I don't. I don't mean to be glib when I say that. I uh, directed study is a huge boon, uh, you know, when it comes to learning a language. But I think J Japanese is particularly uh, well suited to immersion experiences. I think that it would be very difficult. It's not impossible, but much more difficult to become a fluent speaker or even listener uh, of Japanese without spending a great deal of time in the country because it is an extremely contextual language. Uh, as people who have learned and speak Japanese know, Japanese speakers often omit subjects from their sentences. You're supposed to, what is said in Japanese, KY to kuki o yomu, to read the air and kind of intuit the uh, uh, context of things being said to you. That's very difficult to pick up from textbooks um, and it's also very difficult to pick up from comic books and anime, much as I would love to say watch and read anime uh, uh, to, to learn Japanese. It is a, it's part of a balanced diet, but it should not be your only source. The number one thing I would say for translators, however, is to read a, and write a lot in your target language. If you're looking to become an English, if you're looking to be Japanese to English translator, the best translators from Japanese to English are not necessarily the best speakers of Japanese. They are inevitably the best writers of English. So I would definitely not neglect your writing habits, your writing skills. If you're still in school, take creative writing courses, take journalism courses, because those abilities to construct sentences well uh, will serve you in times when you are struggling through a totally arduous Japanese sentence that goes on and on because run-on sentences are totally fine in Japanese. So uh, <laughs> as, as, uh, as any translator will tell you, I used to be a patent translator and literally we would get a sentence that was a single page uninterrupted sometimes. Uh, that was a great experience getting thrown into that deep end uh, to learn how to be a translator. So also trying to find, a, trying to find an in-house position where people can mentor you. That's, that's really key as well, I think. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to read out one final question because it uh, it says what I think. Really fascinating. This has been such an interesting webinar. Would it be possible to have a second installment in the near future? So let's do it again. Let's um, do it again. <laughs> so many questions, so much interesting uh, material. So thank you very much, Matt Out, for, uh, for being with us and for, uh, for sharing uh, that amazing uh, array of experience in Japanese pop culture and, and in the whole phenomenon. Um, and uh, thanks to all of our audience uh, for being on the call. Uh, it's been a great audience, great lot of questions. And I think we're going to kind of collect all the questions and send them over to you because there's please, so many. Please, please. And by all means, please, uh, to, to everybody who's listening today, by all means, drop me a line, stay in touch. I, I love 
talking about this stuff. And I, Bill, today was an absolute honor. I, this really has been a, a highlight of my experience talking about the book so far. Fantastic. Well, great. We'll see you soon. See you in Tokyo whenever I'm allowed to get there. Yes, please. <laughs> please look me up. Uh, and uh, and uh, thank you again. Thank you to all the audience. Have a great evening.